All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us for session 2A on US buyout policies. I'm AR Siders. I'm joined today here by Kelly Main, Megan Mullen, Alex Pennington, Caroline Cron, Linda Shai, and Jamie Vanuki. Uh, we're going to be discussing buyouts and recent research on buyouts and property acquisition in the US. Everyone is going to speak for about 12 minutes and we'll maintain some time at the end to be able to answer questions from the audience. So if you're watching and you have questions, please use the Q&A function on the hub to ask your questions and we'll be getting to them at the end. Hopefully we'll have time for that verbal discussion, but if not, we'll try to get back to uh, those answers in writing. All right, thanks. For our first speaker, uh, Kelly Main. Uh, from the buy-in community planning is going to be talking about the work that buy-in community planning is doing and the tools that they are building to help improve buyouts and their processes. All right, is that my cue to take it away? <laughs> that is, go for it. All right, thanks, Ciders. All right, let me just get set up very quickly. I'm assuming that's working the way that it's supposed to. All right. Turn my time around. All right. So, hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for including me on this panel. I'm Kelly Leilani Main, and I'm the executive director and co founder of Buy in Community Planning. And it's really exciting to be back in this space. I remember two years ago, it felt like this world of research was so small, and it's incredible to see so many new disciplines and stakeholders involved in the conversation. And I'm really excited to talk to you a bit more about our organization for that exact reason. We started buy-in to build more buy-in for the home buyout process, which means identifying key partnerships and building supportive coalitions of stakeholders centered around people, housing, and land, and their intersections. And we wanna help people relocate away from high vulnerability areas. So just to ground ourselves in some of the key issues that we're seeking to address, First, we know that exposure to environmental hazards is increasing, and without mandatory flood disclosure laws and more substantial floody, floodway zoning regulations, this risk will continue to increase. Second, we know that buyouts are fundamentally about housing. There's a bit of a misconception that buyouts will only privilege wealthy or second homeowners in coastal areas, but buyouts can help low-income folks as well. Third, our ecosystems are suffering. The construction and maintenance of carbon intensive mitigation strategies like seawalls and levees creates a feedback loop of reliance on carbon intensive mechanisms that defer planning for irreversible climate impacts and may even incentivize maladaptation. So this is why we think buyouts are such a powerful tool. In theory, buyouts can help reduce vulnerability and eliminate exposure. They can provide financial compensation and security for affected households. They can provide space for ecosystems to adapt, but unfortunately buyouts are not unlocking their full potential. And that's because in general, communicating about buyout programs is extremely challenging. In theory, a buyout program should be simple. A homeowner tells the government they want to move and the government pays them, which enables them to move. But in reality, the process is extremely complicated. Just deciding which buyout program to apply for can be a barrier for under-resourced local governments. And as a result, communities with resources and dedicated staff are the most likely to secure funding from government agencies. Long timelines leave many homeowners no option but to sell, perpetuating cycles of exposure. Very few bio programs have ensured households relocate to areas with lower exposure to environmental hazard, since people generally relocate close by and where they can afford, which is sometimes in the same neighborhood. We also know that inconsistent federal allocations make institutional learning extremely difficult because of granting deadlines, after which funding runs out, making it difficult to develop best practices and monitoring protocols. Bio programs also do not effectively address historic housing discrimination, limiting the participation of BIPOC communities and bringing up serious equity concerns in conversations around managed retreat. So in summary, buyouts have a lot of potential, but they're seated in a system of interlocking crises, including social and economic inequality, unaffordable housing, legacies of historic discrimination, and increasing climate risks. And we know that these are problems, and there are dozen more, dozens more, many of which will be discussed at this panel and at this conference, but reform for these programs has been slow. So we've been trying to figure out what we can do right now to help communities affected by these compounding challenges who might be interested in relocating. 
And that doesn't mean going out and trying to implement a million buyouts overnight, but rather by designing tools and processes for human-centered buyout programs that bring holistic value to communities and make everyone involved feel better off. So we believe that one of the limitations of more substantial reforms is that program priorities currently set eligibility determinations. That means the mandates of FEMA programs drive what FEMA will or will not prioritize when it's allocating its dollars. As said famously in the FEMA allocations for Houston this year, quote, it's math. And although HUD programs have more of an emphasis on housing, the low and moderate income communities they seek to serve don't necessarily have the resources or capacity to take full advantage of their programs. So in order to make a truly human-centered buyout process, we have to start with the people. And that's why the suite of tools that we are building reverses the logic of buyout program design implementation. Rather than priorities determining who participates, we figure out who wants to participate and then match or design programs that fit their unique needs, eligibility, and local context. Who participates, where they are currently are, and where they aspire to relocate to are questions that relate to people, housing, and land. This three-part approach lays the foundation of our programmatic services and buyout program design. It also lays the foundation for a national voluntary registry of buyout interest. We believe it's a common misconception that individuals need to be told what their risks are and convinced that they should relocate. And challenge to that, we're seeking to visibilize the currently invisible demand for relocation assistance and supporting mainstreaming relocation as a legitimate adaptation strategy that deserves more attention and resources. Our survey-driven database enables a systems-based approach that identifies the unique case management and rehousing needs of individuals, drives funding decisions and external partnerships, and identifies key stakeholders in implementation from affordable housing demand to environmental restoration and recreation initiatives. So how does this actually work? Well, in, in addition to the national sign-up form, we partner with local community organizations and governments to request our help. And I wanna share a bit more about a community that we've been working with in DeSoto, Missouri. We were connected to Susan Wiley from the Citizens Committee for Flood Relief, which is a community organization that's a member of the Anthropocene Alliance's Higher Ground Network. DeSoto is a small city outside of St. Louis that's been hit with catastrophic flash flooding, resulting in deaths, disinvestment, and community deterioration in a neighborhood that has over 200 structures located in the FEMA-designated floodway. We've been working with support from the city manager who wants help who wants to help his community but faces significant limitations and capacity to apply for federal funds. So we started with Citizens Committee for Flood Relief to develop an online survey that was publicly accessible on Facebook where residents get a lot of their information. After receiving about 36 responses, Citizens Committee recommended we reach out to the rest of the households via paper mailings and door-to-door -door surveying. So we provided Citizens Committee with a tablet that they could take on their door-to-door -door activities and are providing them a stipend for their work. This universal design process is intended to meet the diverse needs of residents and empowers trusted community leaders as one of the most effective ways to generate trust in the process. The survey includes multi-dimensional information about buyout interests. Rather than just signing up for a buyout, residents have an opportunity to express their interest in participating and are asked what matters to them in their decision to relocate. That might be money, safety and security, or community ties. It also helps us understand what next steps are for each of the participants in the survey, whether it's forming a locally specific prioritization index and identifying financial counseling needs and mobility constraints. Even people who are not interested in buyouts can be included in the process to become community advocates or supportive players. We're also developing a communication system which keeps people who are interested in buyouts regularly informed in a method that works from them, whether it's email, phone, text, or paper mail. Frequent lapses in communication may be partially responsible for people giving up and not making it all the way through a buyout process. The survey also informs particip participant perspectives on their past, current, and future housing aspirations. Understanding perspectives on appreciation, what types of housing people want to move into, the key drivers for participation, and asking them what their relocation assistance needs are not only encourages thoughtful decision-making, but informs the types of supportive services that we need to provide. It also informs our rehousing cost gap analysis, a novel tool that we're developing with an incredible intern this summer. 
The rehousing cost gap analysis shows our team the differential between home values in flood vulnerable areas and those located on higher ground, revealing the supplementary assistance needs to ensure that folks are awarded enough support to relocate to safer areas. Our project management platform provides not only summaries of filed interests and expenses, but also identifies spatial patterns that can inform the reuse of vial property, whether those are adjacent parcel programs, clusters, or nearby features like parks that can be extended or expanded. In DeSoto, our partners have been working tirelessly to bring funding for workshops, studies from Army Corps of Engineers and USGS, and even funding awards for planning from APA and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Citizens Committee aspires to convert bioparcels into a greenway system to connect the rest of their city to Walters Park, which is a cherished community asset. Our survey helps us determine that CDBG funds are likely to be a good option for funding this year if allocations are made at the state level due to the LMI nature of the community. We help the city apply for and secure a CDBG mitigation planning grant that will enable a comprehensive flood mitigation and adaptation strategy and increase the likelihood of DeSoto securing funds for buyouts while we look for partnerships to make the Parkway project possible. This end use visioning is essential to buyout program success. One of the impetus for starting buy-in was to challenge the narrative that buyouts are fundamentally about loss, a loss of housing, a loss of community, a loss of property tax revenue, we're working with a grant from Lincoln Institute of Land Policy to develop scenario planning exercises and workshops for communities to envision the highest value option for reuse of floodplain buyout parcels to maximize buy-in and find novel partnerships for implementation, operations, and maintenance. So in summary, we have a few key takeaways so far for the design of better buyout programs. First, we're not gonna solve these solutions overnight. We have to be bold, but also humble and honest about what we can and cannot accomplish and when. First and foremost, a human-centered process puts people first, which means doing relationship building and asking questions before making recommendations. Third, don't rush the process. Some households are ready to move as soon as possible, but others need more time. Either assurances that they can be made secure and whole after a buyout, or also just time to manage their grief. And lastly, as applied researchers and practitioners, we're in a huge position of privilege that we believe requires us to do the hard work of navigating these processes in service to communities so that residents can do the critical work on the ground driven by local considerations, context, and culture. So we're a brand new organization and we're always looking for partnerships and new opportunities to connect. Um, we'd love to hear from you if you have any questions or wanna reach out to partner with us. Um, really appreciate you tuning in to listen today and hope to be in touch soon. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. It's uh, so exciting to hear about all the work that you're doing in these communities. And uh, I'm introducing myself next, so I'll try to segue away uh, from your work. Oh. And you were right on time, so excellently done on that <laughs> time elements. So, uh, thanks for that. I'm going to talk a little bit, I mean, continuing the theme of buyouts, but continuing the theme of why local capacity is so important. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, there's a huge amount of research that is coming out in the buyout space, and we're seeing this growing rapidly. Uh, lots of research that's occurring, uh, but research that isn't necessarily getting used. Uh, so research that isn't getting cited by other academics or research that isn't getting translated into policy. All right, so a recent search, I was surprised by the amount of research that we find. Uh, 135 academic studies on managed retreat in the United States, more than half of those focusing on buyouts uh, specifically, and starting in 1973, all the way through papers that have been published just this week that are still coming out. The majority of those, well, 41% of those are single case studies, so they're looking at a particular aspect of one particular buyout or a town with buyouts in two neighborhoods. Uh, there are very few that are comparative. There's 15% are multiples. They're looking at multiple locations, but they're not necessarily comparing and contrasting between those experiences, which I think is an opportunity to, for us to uh, improve in the future. We also have nonprofit reports, uh, such as the one by the Natural Resources Defense Council that Kelly mentioned, looking at the timing of these. And we have a document published in 2011 that included 137 FEMA case studies of buyout programs across the United States uh, that we're currently trying to dig into. So this is part of an ongoing project to take all of this literature and to try to make sense of it. And the way I'm trying to make sense of it is that in buyouts, 
the goal as I see it is for us as academics to be able to tell practitioners information like in a given context, which processes will lead to which outcomes, right? Is it preferable to have a buyout or is it preferable to have a community relocation? Should we pursue a shorter timeline or a faster? How should we think about relocation? All of these things will depend on the context. So to be able to provide that advice to practitioners, we need to understand all three, the context, the process, and the outcomes. And this is a challenge, but my hope is that by integrating across these data sources that we have, we will at least be able to find the gaps in our analysis. So when I look at these, one of the concerns, uh, mostly I'm gonna be thinking about context and process. And looking at the context in which these studies have occurred, they're occurring mostly across the United States, the darker the blue, the more studies are located in a given state. Uh, and we say there's pretty good distribution with more than expected in Texas, North Carolina, and New York. One of the, and this uh, matches fairly well with where buyouts are occurring. Although one of the challenges we see is that the median buyout size in FEMA database is just 11 homes. So on average, a buyout program buys 11 homes or maybe even fewer homes than that. But the programs that we're studying are purchasing hundreds of homes or thousands of homes. The median number of buyouts the median buyout size in the academic literature is 362. That's a big distinction. So perhaps there's an area for us to do more research on these small buyouts to understand how they match or don't match with these larger buyouts. Do we see different experiences in, in these areas? And then again, we're getting this geographic spread, but one thing that's also notable is that the buyout study locations are all occurring in very urban areas. So very dense areas, anywhere where you see an anomaly. <laughs> basically in the density population of the United States, that's where a buyout study has occurred. So we're missing all of these studies on smaller buyouts that are occurring in rural areas. Uh, we have some, but we don't have as many. And so I think this raises some really interesting questions about what our information is, what context do we have, where, where are we oversampling or undersampling, and what can we learn from these examples if they're not representative? People all, all, all the time select on extreme cases, outliers, right? And we can learn a lot from them, but we learn different things than if we think they're representative. And I'm a little bit concerned that maybe we're taking the results from these studies of exceptional cases, and we are presuming that they are representative of the normal experience of a buyout practitioner or of a buyout community, right? Thinking about buying up several hundred homes in a very dense urban area is going to be a very different experience than buying up five homes in a small rural town. And we should be thinking about those differently. And so we, one of the challenges that I think we see ahead of us is trying to figure out how those contexts will affect what we are learning from these processes. We also, of course, have the traditional challenge of selecting on the dependent variable, right? This is a very academic problem, but we're only studying places that do buyouts. We're, we're not studying the places that didn't get to do buyouts, but maybe wanted to. We're not studying the people who didn't get buyouts with very rare exception. We're seeing a few studies, especially very recently, that are looking at people who did not take buyouts, who stayed behind and what outcomes they experienced. But when we only study the people who accepted buyouts, only study the people, who, the communities who took buyouts, we're missing out on that comparison. It's hard to understand whether the outcomes we are seeing are due to the buyout process, whether they are due to the disaster that maybe prompted that buyout, or whether they're due to a legacy of disinvestment that made buyouts the best option in this area. So we need more comparisons in order for us to understand the causality of which things, uh, which outcomes we're looking at are actually related to buyouts. So I think this is gonna be another challenge for our, our field moving forward and, and an area where we're trying to find the gaps in the literature right now. In terms of thinking about the process, uh, we're digging through the literature as I suggested, but also ongoing right now are a series of interviews with buyout practitioners. So we're doing buyout practitioners with 20 localities across eight states, uh, talking to them about their process, how they go through the buyout process, what outcomes they've observed, and some of the things that have been surprising to me are the just the number, uh, the, the range of variation that exists within a program. Uh, I would have thought that federal guidelines would provide more uniformity than there is. There's actually a great range of uniform uh, variation even within the same federal program. Participation capacity is a huge problem for communities. Uh, every community we've spoken to has done a buyout. So speaking of selecting on the dependent variable, but they all reference communities nearby who don't have the capacity to participate and so haven't participated because they don't have the staff. And I was surprised by this because the narrative I consistently hear is that it's local match is the problem. It's finding the money. 
And we were explicitly told by at least one interviewee that money is not the problem. The problem is people. And specifically, it's finding people who can navigate the federal bureaucracy, who can navigate the state bureaucracy, who can figure out all of the pieces of this buyout problem and put them together. And so experience is incredibly important. And because experience is important and because long-term relationships are important, the short-term funding that we use to supplement local capacity, to help build local capacity through, say, HMGP management funds is not a solution. Uh, and we need a longer term solution to help build long term local capacity if we want buyouts to be more equitably distributed, if we want them to be an option for all communities. Uh, there are various different types of experience that are needed. Uh, many of you will not be surprised by anything on this list, right? People need experience with the Uniform Relocation Act to understand about tenant rights. They need experience with real estate transactions to understand how that timeline will work and what the, all the steps are. They need experience in assessing damage, in assessing home value, in doing environmental site inspections, which are all part of the buyout process. Uh, and realizing that it's very rare for one person at a local level to have all of these areas of expertise, the challenge becomes, how do you find these areas? How do you leverage other people's expertise without raising your costs? Because it becomes a huge problem. And things that surprised me through these interviews, which I will relate, are uh, first of all, how well the system can be gamed. And by what I mean by this is that certain communities have decided that they know how to get more money. They can get more federal support for buyouts by hiring former FEMA officials who understand the application process in and out, who have detailed understanding of how to administer federal grants and are therefore faster at it, more efficient, more likely to win those grants. So the communities that do this, they receive a larger percent of the disaster funding than they might otherwise do so. So they have, they have gamed the system to their benefit. They have done this to support their residents. But what happens to the communities who can't do that, who don't have the capacity to play that game? And why is the system set up in a way that it allows for this gamification in the first place? So this was a real concern, uh, I think, for equity and thinking about how we approach this moving on. This so clearly, in my mind, drives inequity, uh, that communities are barred from participation because of this personnel, not just receiving federal money, which is a relatively, I mean, I was about to say relatively straightforward process. It's a very difficult process, but there is a process for it, as opposed to the process for providing additional support and additional technical expertise. Um, what I was surprised on this side is that the feds are not considered a source of support. In fact, they are considered very much adversarial. Uh, anyone listening to, to this that, that disagrees, please put it in the chat, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, but the stories that local officials would tell about buyouts were not about receiving help from FEMA officials. They were about FEMA officials who knew less about the buyout process than the local officials did, about FEMA officials who inaccurately applied policy, who made recommendations to do things that were illegal and that the local officials knew were illegal and wrong. And the local officials then had to spend time and had to have the expertise to know that those things were wrong and to fight back against FEMA. And then they talk about how this not only delays the process, but this is a power dynamic, right? If the local officials trying to educate FEMA when FEMA has the say over whether or not they get money. Uh, and states can play a real role here in helping to mediate between the feds and the local government. But there's also a clear role for increasing capacity, not only at the local level, but also at the federal level to remove this block at the federal uh, program, that the federal people who are providing technical expertise should have the expertise to provide technical assistance. I don't mean to suggest that all FEMA agents are incompetent or don't know their position, but so many people working for FEMA are generalists. They have to be generalists in so many areas that they don't understand the intricacies of a buyout process. And maybe FEMA needs people who are informed on the details of this process to be involved. And then finally, I was very much struck by how much personal value shaped the way that these practitioners implemented buyouts. So for example, uh, some practitioners decided that they would prioritize buyouts in low-income neighborhoods. And they did this specifically because they wanted to do what was fair. They know these communities are more at risk, that they are more likely to experience damage, they may have fewer resources to adapt in place. And so they wanted them to get these resources for buyouts. On the other hand, there were practitioners who said, we absolutely do not offer buyouts in low income areas because we are concerned they will feel coerced out of their homes. We're concerned that they will not be able to find replacement housing nearby, that they will have to leave the community and the community chives. And so these practitioners come to the completely opposite decision about how to administer their program, both in good faith, both trying to do what they feel is right, 
uh, and both making the completely opposite decision based on their personal values and the way that they see what is right about a buyout. Uh, there was a huge debate between officials we talked to, for example, about the ethics of achieving your local match by asking the homeowner to take a reduced price for their home. If the homeowner is paid 12.5% less of their home, that could compensate for the local match. What are the ethics of that? Uh, and in some communities, again, this was seen as a benefit because it was the only way that these local communities would be able to afford buyouts at all. And they wanted to be able to help people. They felt that getting 88.5% of the value of your home was better than getting 0% and having to stay in place. And other communities felt that this was absolutely unethical and absolutely unjust and would be terribly wrong, especially to low-income residents. I don't have evidence to say which one is right or which one is wrong. So I offer it simply as an example of how personal values are shaping the way that buyout programs are structured and the way that they're implemented in ways that really matter for the people who are participating. And the more research we can get to understand how these processes lead to different outcomes, the better advice we'll be able to give on how these processes should be structured in the future. All right, that's my time, thanks. So stop my share and introduce our next speaker who is Megan Mullen from Duke University. She's gonna be speaking about local political decision-making uh, using a survey of local elected officials. Take it away, Megan. Thanks, Siders. Um, you set the stage beautifully, <laughs> or I should say I'm piggybacking on you. Um, this is an exploratory study that really uh, kind of lays the groundwork for a larger project. So I'd be very glad to get feedback um, from the audience, you know, even offline um, in order to inform my future work. And I'm a political scientist, um, and my interest is in the political decision making around property buyouts, um, and particularly at the local government level, right? Um, Jackie Patterson this morning uh, framed it as who's pulling the strings and managed retreat? Well, very often it's local governments who are pulling the strings. Um, and there's wide recognition that local governments need to be in the conversation um, about managed retreat and about buyouts. Um, but we have limited understanding of the preferences and the concerns of local elected officials. Um, as, as Siders just described, much of the research has you know, understandably focused on places where buyouts have occurred or have been considered. Um, but if we expect this policy to spread with intensification of climate impacts, um, it's worthwhile to, to get a broader view of how local elected officials might respond. We know from observational research, right, that property buyouts have been concentrated so far in the United States in areas that, are, that have lower income than surrounding communities. Um, and there are myriad normative questions to ask about that, about justice and agency in these patterns of buyouts. But there are also empirical questions. Um, do decision makers currently prioritize residents according to wealth, right? As we heard, some decision makers are doing that. Or is this pattern that we're observing a consequence of other factors like property damage, which itself might be a legacy of prior local government decision making? And you know, observational studies of buyouts, right, can't disentangle these various influences on decision making. Um, but to the extent possible, I want to try to do that. I want to try to isolate how the targeting of policies, right, the identification of particular recipients, um, particularly by, by income group, how that affects local government decision making on buyouts. And so, again, I did this exploratory study um, using a survey, a national survey conducted uh, last spring. And it's a survey of local elected officials nationwide. And these local elected officials are pretty representative of local elected officials 
throughout the United States. And so that means this isn't New York and Miami for the most part, there is one big city in there. Um, but these are, you know, mayors and council members and county commissioners in small places um, by and large, right? And, and these are the kinds of small places that are doing a lot of the small buyouts. But, but my sample is not capturing communities that are experiencing particular vulnerability. Um, we're, you know, what I'm doing is capturing sort of the broad array of communities across the United States. Um, and you can see, right, that about 50% of the respondents to my survey are not at all concerned or only slightly concerned about sort of near term risks from extreme events, right? A quarter of them are very or extremely concerned. Um, but 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 the purpose here, right, is to is to capture the perceptions and the opinions of um, public officials, elected officials at the local government level, who haven't really thought about buyouts and probably don't even know what they are. And so what I did was embed a randomized experiment in this survey. And the survey design looked like, the experimental design looked like this. I, I created a vignette, right? A little story about a particular buyout. And within that vignette, um, the, the recipients were identified either as low income, as wealthy, or there was a control group where, where there was no sort of income identifier associated with the homeowners whose properties would be bought. And then I asked these elected officials, you know, what's the likelihood that you would support this buyout? But I also wanted to try to, to create what, what would happen in real communities, right? Which is um, kind of a policy learning process, right? The, the policy would be introduced, but then people would have to learn and reflect about it. And so after measuring the support for the buyout, I presented um, a list of you know, benefits that people have outlined for buyouts and a list of drawbacks that people have outlined for buyouts, had the, the elected officials reflect on those benefits and drawbacks, and then asked again, right? What's the likelihood that you would support this, um, this particular buyout in this case. And so I'm introducing the policy and then I'm asking for, for you know, some learning, some reflection and asking again what their response might be. It also gave me the opportunity to learn from these elected officials what their perceptions are of these benefits and drawbacks, which ones are most important to them. So here's the vignette. It outlines a voluntary buyout, right? So this is a buyout where homeowners are coming to the town and requesting the buyout. There's a local cost share. I give a short description at the beginning of what a buyout is and the justification for it, because again, I'm assuming that, that most folks responding to my survey have not thought about this before. And I didn't want, right, the cost itself of the buyout which is you know, potentially larger if they're, if they're wealthy homeowners. I didn't want that to drive the result. And so I didn't name sort of numbers of properties. I just said, you know, I gave a, a cost recovery period that was the same across all the experimental conditions. And what did I find? find? Oops. Well, I was, I was, you know, this is a complex vignette and it's asking a lot of, of public officials to respond to this. And I was glad to see that, that two thirds did give some directional response on whether they would be likely to support the buyout. And, and the majority of those that gave the directional response said that they would be unlikely. But how did the policy target, right? How did the, the, the identity of the recipients of these buyouts influence their decisions? Well, I found that elected officials were initially more likely to support buyouts for low-income homeowners, right? There was a, it, it, identifying 
paying the recipient homeowners as low income produce sort of a, a 0.3 increase on a four point scale um, in likelihood of supporting the buyouts as compared to the control. So you can think about this as sort of a 7% higher support as compared to the control. Identifying homeowners as wealthy was no different from the control. So then I was presenting, right, these, these benefits and drawbacks. And, and, you know, I tried not to, to sort of frame people's responses in these lists of benefits and drawbacks, but to lean on the literature um, in identifying which benefits and drawbacks um, are kind of most dominant in this conversation. Um, and for the benefits, right, in terms of how respondents scored their importance, I really found very little variation. Um, the respondents, um, uh, the responses across these different questions were highly intercorrelated. There didn't seem to be a lot of differentiation in how they thought about these benefits. But interestingly, targeting the buyouts, right, towards sort of an identified group of homeowners increased the importance of the, many of these benefits, right? So identifying homeowners as wealthy who are re receiving the buyouts increased the importance of many of these benefits. The same was true in terms of identifying the homeowners as low income, but to a lesser degree, right? These effect sizes were somewhat smaller. For the drawbacks, there was more variation in how public officials um, thought about these drawbacks and, and sort of judged their importance. The drawback that they found most important was the direct cost of the buyout, right? Because there was a cost share outlined in this project. Um, and, and, you know, much less concern in terms of, you know, the long-term maintenance costs of vacant land. And here, the identity of the respondents really didn't have much impact um, in terms of how they thought about the importance of these different drawbacks. Um, even the one effect that I found was, was sort of weak um, and, and less important. So then I went back and asked again, right? What is, you know, um, uh, how likely would you be to support this buyout? Now that you've had an opportunity to reflect, to learn a bit and, um, and consider this proposal. And I found with that consideration, support overall support for the particular buyout declined. Um, the exposure to the benefits and drawbacks of a buyout and potentially reinforcement of this targeting, right? Because I renamed what the group of homeowners would be, um, contributed to a decline in support in the second round. And the decline was among those who thought that the buyouts would be for wealthy homeowners. So this is showing the, the first result that I showed you earlier, but then the change in support is among those who thought that the buyouts would be for wealthy homeowners. There was a slight decline among the control group too, but, but there's no movement in um, the support for low income that persists. And so the gap right across the kind of targets of the policy is bigger after learning and reflection. Uh, you know, a brief summary, right? There's a lot more to talk about, but, but a brief summary that, you know, buyouts are not for public officials who have not thought about this policy before, who are not, right? It's kind of, you know, on the front line of thinking about this. Buyouts are not in an immediately popular policy and, and support seems to decline with more information. Targeting buyouts to a particular income group, regardless of what, of what income that is, um, boost perception of buyout benefits, right? And, and that's consistent with political science literature, right? It, it sort of makes the policy more salient if you, can, if you can think about particular targets rather than universal targets. Um, local officials are more supportive of buyouts for low income than for wealthy residents, especially after, after this learning and reflection. Um, there's also, you know, there are numerous limitations to this kind of approach, and I would say they're, they're mostly summarized by they're either, it's both overly general and overly specific at the same time, right? The approach is ignoring this, the really important contextual con considerations in any case, and it's also specific to the language of the vignette. Um, 
but but I do think that there's value in starting to think about what the reactions, what are the likely reactions of decision makers who haven't yet engaged with these kinds of conversations, right? The decision makers who this isn't on their radar yet, but it might be in the future. And if we can start anticipating what their reactions might be, that's an important part of building policy strategies, communication strategies that can help get us to equitable outcomes as this policy spreads. Thanks. Thanks very much, Megan. Uh, our next speaker is Alex Pennington from New York State Governor's Office of Storm Recovery to discuss the New York Rising Buyout Program. Welcome, Alex. Hey, hopefully you can hear me. Let me get this screen shared. Okay. All right, here we go. Um, so here, you're looking at the enhanced buyouts area of Oakwood Beach in Staten Island, where over 300 parcels of land have returned to nature following disaster recovery efforts after the wake of Superstorm Sandy. Uh, the green space here is like clearly prevalent, uh, it's clearly visible, uh, there's more green space, there's more nature, there are fewer buildings in the floodplain. What's missing from this picture are the people involved in the program. They're no longer living in this green space, and in thinking about our program that we're running with many more parcels than just 300. Um, we want to know where these people went uh, and essentially what do the movements of our applicants mean for a successful manager retreat program for us and uh, in future programs. Um, already given an introduction to me, so I'll skip that. Uh, but in New York State, um, we have um, a, you know, in the wake of Superstorm Sandy, we have uh, incorporated both buyouts and acquisition strategies uh, currently with 657 million allocated to the program. Uh, we've bought over uh, 1200 properties on a voluntary basis uh, from residents flood prone flood prone neighborhoods, um, primarily within Staten Island uh, and Long Island, but elsewhere throughout the state too. Over 500 of these properties were acquisitions, um, where that land is eligible for redevelopment uh, for more resilient structures. Over 700 buyout properties uh, are complete where that land has been re uh, restored to nature uh, and is not eligible for any redevelopment. It's going to stay um, as green, green land. Um, we have, you know, 1,200 properties, and given the large nature of our buyouts program and thinking about managed retreats, um, we saw an opportunity to try and answer the question of, well, where did our applicants go and what could that mean for future policies that we, we may implement in the future? Um, we are, our work on finding our allocated um, allocated uh, applicants uh, is, is complete. We've done some work in finding them uh, and it's complete with some success. Um, our work in sort of analyzing the data and having results is still very much underway. So we are, I will be presenting today sort of the, the short methodology uh, and how we matched our applicants and what we uh, want to do in the future. Hopefully next time we will have more interesting results and once we found those patterns. Um, but talking about uh, the data that we have, you know, we're a government agency, uh, we're sitting on a, a, an unbelievable amount of data about our applicants. Um, we record and house all of our application data in sort of a custom built application and that data is then stored in the storm recovery data warehouse, um, where we just keep all of the stuff, have access to all of the stuff, can manipulate all of this data and do pretty wonderful things. Um, we have uh, the location of all of our buyouts, the parcel size, the property damage, um, appraisal, both pre and post storm of the property. We've got, you know, how much money we've given to applicants um, under various places. Um, we have relocation incentive uh, awards that we've given to some applicants, and I'll say more about that in a second. We have household size, household status, whether they own the property, whether they were renting, um, URA, all, all of that sort of stuff. And importantly, in thinking about equity, we have 
a ton of demographic information and we are required to report this demographic information to HUD um, to talk about our um, progress reports um, that we've released quarterly. But we do have dates of birth, we've got race, ethnicity, uh, we have their gender, we have their income, and then that's something we have to report for good reason, but that's data that we also have access to so we can dive into those sort of demographics. And when we're looking for patterns, we can look for patterns and look to make sure that our program is equitable when we do do this research. Um, so that's important to note there. So the question of where did our applicants move to? We've answered this question uh, to a degree because we have a relocation incentive program, uh, a 5% um, pre-storm fair market value relocation incentive was added, um, uh, was given, was, sorry, uh, was made for eligible participants if they permanently relocated uh, and provided evidence of their uh, purchased property, if that primary property, primary residence was, was located within the same county. Um, so we had to verify their house was in the same county, their new primary location, we know where they went to, they get a relocation award, we know where they went. Um, so if you can always collect this sort of information on the front end, that's a lesson uh, that we learned. We can get it and that's good to know. Uh, so we have this information for some of our applicants. Um, however, that's only for people in the BIOS program and it only captures those applicants who wanted to sort of stay within the same county or get a relocation incentive. And um, that doesn't cover everyone. What about people who moved outside of the county? We want to know more about them. So even though we've got some good data already, we wanted to add more. We wanted to really get a good idea of where people went, not just where people in the relocation incentive program went. Um, so to find the rest of our applicant data, we wanted to experiment with existing tools that were out there to link our data uh, to publicly uh, available information. Um, and we were able to do this sort of through two methods. First, using LexisNexis, and the second, using tax parcel data. I'm sure many academics know about LexisNexis, large data mining platform. Uh, we have access to the public record search tool, which combines tens of thousands of public records uh, and can link people uh, between those records. So with this tool, uh, we were able to find, input our data, find our applicants based on you know, their address, their name, their date of birth that we have on file. Um, we were able to find if they had bought a, if they had a deed, if they had bought property after participating in our program. We were able to collect this information, code all of this in, and essentially have a set of geospatial data of where our applicants' damaged property was and where they moved to. Uh, this was a very time-intensive task. Uh, and my team did a fantastic job in, in combing through all of this data, which is a lot. But it wasn't always perfect, um, so we tried sort of a second method, which was sort of a fuzzy match, looking at fuzzy matching, um, again, our data to New York State tax parcel data, which had some success, but was more trouble than it was worth. And I'm happy to maybe talk more about that, but in the interest of time, I'll move on. I just do not recommend fuzzy matching to public data. So our results, overall, we were able to match 60% um, of our total universe. We have 665 applicants matched out of a universe of 1,112 applicants. Um, we had a manual match rate of around 44%, um, looking at our entire buyout universe. Not all of those are relevant to this 1,112. We had empty parcels, we had rental properties. We were just looking at those who had a one property, before the buyout, we bought out that property and they had a clear sort of movement to a new property afterwards. Um, so 34% relevant to this universe match rate, including our relocation incentive um, applicants. And that was 292. Out of our total buyout program matched, we had 69%, which is pretty good. Total acquisitions matched was 50%. Um, so we did have some success. You could see uh, sort of the numbers here and the percentages here. Um, we weren't able to match 31% uh, of our buyouts applicants. We weren't able to match 50% of our acquisition applicants. So not a 100% match rate. I also wouldn't expect a 100% match rate. 
Um, but I don't want to say any more about the people we didn't match since I wouldn't want to make too many assumptions. But a 60% match rate means we, we are able to do an analysis on at least a couple hundred applicants uh, in each program, uh, which is nice. Like I said, I don't want to make assumptions about the unmatched universe. Not everyone may have bought a property afterwards. Uh, but we don't know how many, so I don't want to make assumptions about them. But what we can say is um, we did some testing of the demographics um, of who we were able to match, who we weren't able to match, and the entire universe. And essentially, uh, the demographic makeup of all matched applicants is not statistically different from the larger universe of all buyers, from those who were not matched, um, which is a good sign that at least we can draw some takeaways uh, in terms of patterns from the smaller universe and potentially extend it to our large universe. Essentially, we don't see any statistically significant differences yet between our matched and non-matched universes. So we have some external validity there, but we absolutely want to do more testing to make sure. Um, another takeaway is this was a lot of work for a government agency. We have lots of other work um, that we do. We are <laughs> responsible to the taxpayer and we've got plenty of other work to do. So this is something we you know, wanted to look at. We want to look at our programs, but well aware that not all agencies have, have this ability. Um, so throw that out there. This was a lot of work and it was time intensive. Um, and it also wasn't perfect. LexisNexis was sometimes clearly wrong. When we looked at deed information, we were also able to grab the new value of the house uh, that they bought afterwards, which we also collected. Um, but sometimes that would clearly be wrong. I believe I remember seeing one that was just $10 and there was a clear house there. It wasn't like an empty parcel of land. So, you know, you have to like carefully check these things. It's also manual entry, which also comes with its own, um, you know, oh, you need QA in order to, to make sure that that works properly and that things are inputted correctly. We couldn't always find applicants. Um, we also couldn't always um, find a property for an applicant. Sometimes it was unclear what uh, an applicant did. Maybe they already had, you know, several properties before the buyout and they may have just moved into one. That looks like what happened for some people. So we, we sort of had to leave those out of the universe. And again, like I said, the fuzzy match was extensive work for, for little payoff. But that being said, we've been able to do it. 60% match rate is interesting. So we do have questions we, we are in the middle of exploring. Um, we want to find out essentially where did our applicants go? How close did they stay? and thinking about things that everyone else on this panel has already said, did they stay close to the water? Do, did they move into or out of an area with increased flood risk? Uh, and like I mentioned, speaking of demographic patterns, we wanna see if there are patterns between all of the different demographics uh, that we have. Um, hopefully, <laughs> we hope our program is equitable, uh, but looking at movement to more or less diverse neighborhoods, what is the makeup of the neighborhoods people are moving out of and to is there a change in income level that people move in and out of um and is there a difference between the separate programs between buyouts and acquisitions those are some of the questions that we're already exploring we have initial looks at this data but not able to share those today uh, we were also looking at public information data. You know, we work with census data all the time, thinking about what else we can do there. We have Zillow data. We're interested in looking at um, housing markets and the places where our people are moving to. How does that affect uh, the housing market there and potentially people's decisions? Uh, education data. We know that um, education is often looked at as a, as a proxy for like you know, quote unquote, good and bad neighborhoods. How does that factor into people's decisions? Looking at social vulnerability. Uh, we've got lots on our slate. Um, so these are sort of, we hope to answer some of these questions and present these at the next conference. But this is, we already have some of this downloaded. We're on it. We find it very interesting. Um, so that's pretty much it. I did want to um, give a shout out to my team who did a lot of this work uh, and our in on this. Um, so thanks to them for doing a lot of the manual work. Uh, and thank you for having me on the panel today to explain some of the uh, interesting work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, and what a nice segue into our next presentation. Uh, Carolyn Cran from the University of Miami is going to present on buyout outcomes for participants across the United States, so expanding our geographic reach. Uh, she cannot be here with us today, so she's going to be speaking to us through a pre-recorded video. Uh, Jack and Autumn, can you help me by starting that up? Thanks very much. 
Good afternoon to those participants in the Eastern US. Good morning or good evening to those participants in different time zones. My name is Caroline Kran. I'm a PhD student in the Interdisciplinary Environmental Science and Policy Program at the University of Miami. Unfortunately, I'm on leave this summer, and so I'm not able to present live at this session, but will instead be sharing my work through this pre-recorded video. Two years ago, at the first Columbia University at What Point Manager Trade Conference, I shared this map with you. Actually, the yellow one here at the bottom, but they, share, they, they show the same information. We found, through asking questions about where FEMA-funded buyouts have taken place, that more than 40,000 buyouts have taken place in the United States in more than 1,100 different counties. Each dot on this map is actually a different county in which buyout has taken place. We also found some trends in terms of buyouts being more likely to take place in high capacity counties, but that within those counties, more vulnerable neighborhoods were usually where the physical buyouts actually took place. This research very much focused on the buyout properties and where they took place. I'm currently working on a follow-up of this project that focuses not so much on the buyout properties, but instead on the residents who lived in those properties and where they relocated to after they accepted a buyout offer. The research question that I'm trying to answer is where do residents relocate to after they have accepted a buyout offer? In order to be able to answer this question, I use a five-step process. In the first step, I use two data sets that I've obtained from FEMA through a Freedom of Information Act request. The first data set includes physical addresses of buyout properties. The second data set includes homeowner names and geographic information at the zip code level. I also have access to a data set of property detransactions or property sale that is nationwide and hosted by CoreLogic. In step two, I try to find the location or the names of the buyout property or the buyout property homeowner in this really big property sale data set. Because I find, because when I look in this data set and try to look for um, the property sales of a specific uh, property, for example, I find the entire history of sales for that, for that property. In step three, I therefore use characteristics to determine with which of these detransactions is actually describing a buyout. I do this by looking at the timing or looking into who the new buyer of the property is, whether or not this is a government related entity that might be implementing a buyout program and is likely to become the new owner after the buyout has been uh, successfully uh, taken place. After I've done these steps, I then use the names that are on these sales as the people who sold the property in order to find other purchases by these buyout homeowners. Again, this gives me a whole history for, for some people of where they lived, um, of, of where they lived and what properties they purchased. And so therefore in step five, I determine based again on things like timing, and location, whether or not any of these um, other purchases that I find are, indi are indicating the relocation address of where people move to after the buyout has been completed. Because I work with these two different FEMA data sets, one with the addresses and one with the names, I basically run step one to three in parallel. At the end of step three, based on the addresses, I've been able to find about 7,000 buyout detransactions. Based on the names, I've been able to find approximately 6,000 buyout detransactions. Because there's a big overlap between the address-based data set and the name-based data set, unfortunately, this doesn't add up to 13,000, but I end up with 10,000 unique buyouts for which I have information about the property sale now. These 10,000 property sales, uh, buyout sales, then give me the names that I look for in step four in order to be able, at the end of step five, tell me something about the relocation um, address of the buyout residence. I need success in each of these five steps in order to be able to find the homeowner relocation address. I've aimed to visualize this in this flow diagram. I start with approximately 30,000 buyout relocation um, addresses. Unfortunately, not all of these addresses are standardized in the format of a house number and a street name. Sometimes the address is actually more of a descriptor, such as the property next to the church. Um, unfortunately, I cannot use those data sets, and so those flow into my destination not found bucket. I also have a data set with the names, and I found that within those names, not all names refer to residents of buyout properties. In some cases, the property owner is not a resident, but rather a landlord. Um, leasing out the property. In other cases, it might be that a buyout property is actually owned by a uh, organization or a business. And so again, this is not a, uh, an individual resident who, who has to move after, after the buyout. 
Um, here I end up with about 24,000 buyouts. Again, after step three, once I've been able to find the buyouts um, and I've determined that a certain detransaction actually describes the buyout that I'm looking for, I have about 10,000 uh, 10, buyout detransactions. It is equally difficult to then go from those buyout detransactions to post buyout relocation addresses. Um, but in the end, I'm able to find about 3,000 high to medium, medium, con medium to high confidence buyout detransactions. For these buyout detransactions, I'm able to answer questions such as where and when the households relocate. Here in the first, um, the first graph on the left, I plot the distance of the relocation. Some people seem to use the buyout as an opportunity to start anew in a different state, but most people actually move to different locations fairly close by where the buyout took place. Um, the, medium, the median of uh, distance that people move is about eight kilometers, so that's five to six miles from the, buyout, from the buyout location. This means that a lot of people will be able to stay close to their social network as well as to their work or to their school. Sometimes people are afraid that buyouts leave, lead to an exodus of people from the county. However, we've been, we found that about 75% of people who have accepted a buyout actually move to um, a relocation address that is within the same county. When it comes to the timing of the uh, buying a new, a new pur uh, purchasing a new home, we found that about approximately 40% of the people did not wait until the buyout was finalized before they purchased their new relocation home. The, new, the home that became their new where they relocated to. Another 40% purchased a home within a year after the buyout had been completed. About 20% of the people took longer to find a new more permanent home. Some other questions that I would like to answer using this data are different outcomes in terms of, for example, things like flood risk reduction, financial impacts, and whether or not the neighborhood that people lived in versus the, the neighborhood that people moved to is very different. In order to be attuned to equity, I also want to um, look into these outcomes in, in, in terms of different factors and see whether they have an influence. Factors such as wealth, race, or whether the buyout took place in urban or rural uh, communities are, um, will, will be examined in order to see whether or not this influences the buyout, the buyout outcome. This research is, aims to provide some lessons for future manager treat and answer questions about things like the scale and location of where buyouts could be helpful, um, how we could make buyout policies more equitable in practice, and also what, what, what sort of buyouts and um, what sort of outcomes um, we might be looking for and might, we might aim for. Again, I'm unfortunately not able to answer questions live in this session. However, my co-author, Ciders, is here on this panel and she might be able to answer some questions. Additionally, my other co-authors, Catherine Mock and Miyuki Hino, are also present at this conference. Alternatively, feel free to send me an email to ccron.miami.edu. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Excellent. Thanks for your help setting that up. Uh, our Next speakers are Linda Shai and Jamie Vinuki, who are going to talk about state and local programs and lessons for equity and ecological restoration. All right, thanks so much for having us on this panel. It's a great pleasure to be here building on a lot of the research from folks who are on this panel. And I'm learning so much from the very different methods that are being used to study the examples here. Today, we're going to be sharing research about uh, what we're learning from selected buyout programs at the subnational scale. This is research that is funded by a combination of the Nature Conservancy and Cornell University's Atkinson Center for Sustainability. It draws on a really interdisciplinary team, primarily of women who are, who are rock stars from different fields and brings an interdisciplinary view to this research. So today I'll be presenting, I'm in the Department of City and Regional Planning and my colleague, Jamie Venucci is in the Landscape Architecture Department. And um, I think maybe also on the call will be Anjali Fisher, one of the students who did a lot of the work and we've had a great set of students. Um, and you'll see many familiar names like Malia Kodis and others who are also at this conference. So the theme that we are interested in is one that preoccupies many of the people here on this panel and at the conference, which is that what we want when we talk about buyouts is, to, is that after all this sacrifice, we want to leave behind these restored and beautiful and pristine environments. 
But so often what we see if we get buyouts at all is this very fragmented landscape of communities that perhaps are not doing so well. We don't oftentimes until the studies that you guys just presented, we often don't know what happens to the people who go away, but certainly the places that have been um, affected by the disaster appear to be worse off. And so there's, as uh, from the beginning of the presentations, we've known that the FEMA floodplain buyouts are problematic from a number of perspectives. They are too few in number, 40,000 over the last 40 years compared to 13 million that are uh, of people, households that are living in at-risk areas. And yet even such a few number is still financially and um, in many other ways unsustainable. It's also extremely bureaucratic. It takes a very long time. It's inequitable in terms of who it's targeting and the process of who has access to these resources as so many people have talked about. It's limited in scale because it's prioritizing only property parcels, not the communities, not even multifamily houses, uh, much less ecological systems. And oftentimes we see very limited ecological gains Elise Zavar and uh, I think Chuck or somebody, I'm not sure of the middle, uh, the first name of um, but Hegelman, the Zavar and Hegelman paper from 2016 show that between 1990 and 2000 of the 10,000 FEMA parcels that they studied, only 7% might be considered ecologically restored. Some 40% are vacant parcels that might be either a parking lot or a grass lot mode or unmowed. So we need a bigger program. We also need a better program. And the question that all of us here are thinking about is what should such a program look like? And so slightly different from the perspectives of some of the um, other presenters that have been talking about, we looked at five uh, different programs that are considered among the leading ones that when you think about who is doing buyouts well, the ones that are highlighted here, New Jersey Blue Acres, Washington's Ford Plain by Design, Charlotte Mecklenburg County's program, and the programs in Austin Austin and Harris County are often pointed to as the ones that have been doing extremely well. They're also unique in that they are standing programs. So Siders talked about how there's a, such a need for learning and capacity. And oftentimes what you see is a locality or a state, a county or a local government will create a program and re in response to a particular disaster. And so each time they have to novelly learn anew how to go through this entire very complicated process. But each of the programs here is a standing program, they always exist, and that allows them to preemptively and premeditatively anticipate disasters and be dealing with this and, and learning and growing themselves. They also, each of them has some sort of dedicated funding, either through state dollars or a local bond measure or other kinds of stormwater utility or property tax um, levies that allows them to not only generate the local match for the FEMA buyouts, but also have dedicated funding to drive um, free of the federal constraints on funding some of their own initiatives the way that they would like to do to do them. Um, so it's not the it's not the expectation that other places that, that these are necessarily representative, although certainly the state level programs can address the needs of much smaller communities. But it's more that we're asking what have these programs with their uh, um, their wealth of funding, their dedicated funding, the fact that they are long, long standing programs, what have they learned, especially on these issues of equity and restoration, that perhaps FEMA could also um, internalize in order to bring those benefits to all the different places that do not have this level of capacity. So our program, our, our research project has three overarching questions. Um, and the first one is about the extent to which these different programs ha have responded to social equity justice, fairness, however you want to phrase that. Well, how have they responded to those limitations in the FEMA bio program? Second, we're interested in what ecological benefits these programs have achieved after the buyout has taken place. And third, which is our future research, what is the relationship between the social and the ecological policies and outcomes? Do they address each other at all in the design of the program? Do they have any impact uh, and in influencing each other? And how can we move forward towards more um, holistically beneficial retreat? So very quickly today, I'll just share a little bit about um, our first research question, and then my colleague Jamie is going to respond to the second one. We did these case studies of these five programs. We did a literature review of all the different kinds of limitations um, that have been happening, that people have you know, critiqued the PMO bio programs. We interviewed a number of the program managers and their staff across these different programs, along with other folks that are knowledgeable in these regions. And then we closely read each of their policies, the documents of how they 
uh, what kinds of how they operate, what kinds of benefits they per perform, um, what kinds of staff, how do they do casework, all of those things. And then uh, moving forward, we are also conducting focus group discussions with program managers and others in this field. So very briefly, um, I think that a number of these things are, are sort of understood and Siders and colleagues and Caroline recently just came out with a paper that does something quite similar, which is when you look at all of the different critiques, there's a variety of things that people perceive to be problematic in terms of equity for female floodplain buyouts. Let me just start with the two middle columns here around distributive and procedural justice. Um, and so there's you know, issues of targeting that it's not very inclusive. Uh, and so for instance, you know, some of these programs have responded by saying we could have lease back options, we could diversify and not just be basing our analysis of selection around cost benefit analysis. There's a question of the fact that these um, programs primarily favor single family uh, housing. Um, and so Austin, for instance, extends some benefits for landlords so that um, there's uh, the landlords are incentivized to participate in multifamily housing conditions. In New Jersey, they hire experts to help work with the families. Um, Austin, too, I would say they have extensive case work or um, consultants that work with families to minimize the kinds of um, logistical challenges that they face and reduce the capacity uh, barriers for them. In Harris County, this is not a FEMA program, but the CDBGDR program um, actually allows undocumented uh, migrant households to also participate. So there are, for those kinds of challenges, for instance, there are these very discrete responses that programs have been able to innovate at the local level. There's also an issue of procedural injustice, right, around the lack of transparency, the kinds of reactionary time frame, the length of time it takes to do these programs. And all of these different programs respond to this challenge through different forms of communication, website, um, communication uh, with households because they're anticipatory, they are far more uh, leaf in responding to a disaster and have much shorter time frames for responding and getting homes the help that they need. Um, and in, in Harris County, there's a bond measure that, for instance, prioritizes the worst first. But the so one, in one way, you could look at these programs and say there are very specific, tangible solutions to a lot of the things that people are talking about that could be discreetly in, integrated into a FEMA program to look at these. Um, and then there are these broader structural issues because justice is also a relational issue, a relational comparison, not just of what happens to the people who are experiencing the buyout, but historic relations of what happened historically that landed people in this condition of economic and spatial inequality. There's also the spatial relationship of what's going on in other places, what happens to this community afterwards, what happens to people who have to stay here, uh, is there going to be further decline, will there be gentrification, and then there's also the relationship between what these households are getting vis-a-vis -vis those households that are getting other kinds of FEMA or other benefits, such as are they receiving a seawall or are they getting home elevation benefits, whereas low-income groups might be getting a um, buyout procedure. So those kinds of challenges typically do not tend to be addressed by these different programs. Um, and nor is there, you know, generally a whole community relocation place attachment doesn't get addressed. Um, although Austin offers various supports so that people can actually get the housing that they can afford in the local community. So what we would learn, what we think that we're learning from these programs is that when you have these standing programs and they're able to learn and, and uh, innovate and also have the flexibility, they're able to generate solutions that really work locally speaking. Um, and there's a lot that we can learn from them for addressing these distributive and procedural questions. But on these other issues where the bias are really about other people, other spaces, other time periods, those generally fall far outside the authority and the purview of those implementing agencies that are charged with managing buyout programs, which tend to be usually some kind of a stormwater or flood management um, utility district. And those are engineers who have a very set and narrow perspective of what they can do. And so their, their authority doesn't extend to those other spaces that their um, programs don't touch or other issues like housing um, and other things. And so I think there's a huge challenge here of saying, well, even if we make a buyout program extremely equitable, does that really deal with 
that a larger equity question of what caused people to be living in vulnerable conditions and the vulnerability they may experience once they leave the buyout condition. And so we need to be able to address these issues much more holistically than we have been. And that's where some of these focus group discussions where we're talking with uh, people in other sectors outside of the floodplain programs to see where those connections could be made. Jamie? Thanks, Linda. So one of the critical questions for the ecological benefits team has been what to measure, given both the constraint of mostly remote data collection and the range of program goals. Typically, restoration outcomes are assessed relevant to a set of established goals, while goals for restoration across our five case study areas vary greatly from promoting ecosystem recovery in Washington state to places with no restoration focused goals at all. Our lit review includes both assessment strategies for restoration, as well as what kinds of metrics matter most in floodplains. We land on a series of indicators as spectra from weak to strong restoration outcomes for buyouts at the parcel level. Some of these shown here in this enlargement of our map of Austin, Texas, include floodplain hydrological connectivity, uh, parcel con contiguity, like um, is it piecemeal with a high degree of checkerboarding or is there a high degree of system connectivity? Uh, conservation status, is it legally protected through status as a park or conserv conservation area or easement? And the degree of connectivity to other open spaces, including wetlands and forests and parks. Two metrics we're also considering include whether the lot provides flood mitigation, such as flood storage and the percent of impervious cover removed. We're also looking at what contribution buyouts make to buffer zones along creeks and rivers. Okay, next slide, please. A primary measure we've been fleshing out is vegetative cover and complexity. Here, we've been working with the dual axes of degree of vertical structure in the vegetation and the level of maintenance or naturalness, which I realize is a difficult word. Lowest on both spectra is lawn with the lowest level of vertical structure and very high maintenance requirements. Scoring high on both scales would be something like mature forest or meadow with trees, which really depends on the geography. In addition to assessing parcel level outcomes, we're also taking a look at program structure related to the provision of ecological benefits post buyout. For example, some of our questions include, does the program establish clear goals for restoration? Are buyout locations prioritized based on ecological goals or potential benefits? Who manages parcels post buyout and is funding available for restoration? And how is the public participating in decision making and which agencies, personnel and organizations are involved? Next slide, please. So some of our very early findings um, will I'll be share next. So Charlotte Mecklenburg's program was established in 1999 and its original goals include acquiring repetitive loss structures and restoring floodplain, um, natural floodplain functions. In interviews today, program managers state that they value how many people the program has moved and how many acres have been converted to purposeful open space. And so far that's around 25%. Um, Next slide, please. We can use Zavar and Hegelman's research on land use on FEMA buyout projects, um, which was not at the parcel level. I want to make sure that's clear as a comparison. That study found that 34% of the sites remained vacant lots and only 7.5 were actively restored, as Linda mentioned. As you can see in this graphic in Charlotte, while 15.8% of the buyout lots remain homes, only 10.1% are lawn. A quarter of the acquired properties have been transformed or integrated into purposeful open space, such as parks, community gardens, and greenway greenways. And interventions have also dramatically improved water quality in the region, showing a 51% improvement since 2015. Next slide, please. Austin's funding for buyouts is often a mix of city, FEMA, and Army Corps of Engineer money. The Watershed Protection Department states that it combines regulations and restoration to reduce the impact of flooding, erosion, and water pollution. Restoration goals are to preserve the natural and traditional character of the land and waterway. Next slide, please. 
Austin's bioassessment so far has shown only 13% of the parcels remain lawn and 4% still have houses. Typical outcomes for parcels include grow zones, wildflower meadows, and lawn or meadow with large remnant trees. Austin has been successful at clustering buyouts and developing management plans working with local neighborhood residents. 79% of the parcels have a management plan, a clear strength for this city as acceptance by the public for what happens on buyouts is revealed through these cases as a critical factor in determining what kinds of restoration and use are possible. Next slide, please. So these are just some of our very initial findings. We're still really um, knee deep in this, in this data analysis. But a couple of things to note here are that public participation and partnering are key and that we're uncovering strengths and innovations in every one of these programs. Um, so some lingering questions are how to assess programs without clear restoration goals, and then um, is restoration the appropriate term, or should we, looking, should we be looking to something more aligned with um, a reconciled floodplain where people are part of the ecosystem as active manager, managers and participants? Thank you. Thanks so much. And so in conclusion, um, we're ex really excited about the final stage of our research in bringing the ecological and the social dimensions together. So as we saw in the Austin program, a case where the, the program is really um, is targeting uh, a really humane approach to dealing with households and helping them get access to the funding they need in order to buy another home in the nearby area, it's going to achieve much higher levels of participation, which allows for much higher levels of ecological restoration, which also allows for more healing and po other positive benefits. So that could be the kinds of connections where those are really um, integrated with each other. And obviously there's also these vicious counter cycles that could also take place. So we're looking forward to exploring those connections in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for your presentations. Uh, we have a few minutes to try to address some questions from the Q&A or from the chat session. Uh, I'm going to start off with one for Kelly. And we have just 10 minutes. So everyone, we're going to try to keep questions and answers short. Uh, Kelly, could you speak just a little bit more about how you partner with communities and what costs it uh, communities incur by working with buy-in? Sure. Yeah, I am um, not sure if I, I typed up a response, which hopefully some folks can catch, but just to respond to that. So um, we're a brand new organization. We incorporated at the end of last year and our application for nonprofit status is currently pending with the IRS. So we have um, kind of two main ways that we hope to support the work that we're doing. The first is fee for service contracts with cities either as a primary or sub consultant to help them come up with comprehensive buyout plans and strategies for their communities. In that case, the client would be cities. Um, but we also know that there are some communities that simply don't have the capacity to even administer, for example, a contract to work with us in that way. So we are seeking active partnerships with foundations and philanthropic organizations um, that can support our work so that we can provide free or low cost services to community organizations at the local level that are interested in partnering with us to use our tools as advocacy for additional government resources. And in that case, the community organizations would be our client or our primary partners. Right now, we're working primarily through a network of established organizations um, that work with frontline leaders across the country, including the Anthropocene Alliance and their Higher Ground Initiative, which I really recommend checking out if you're not familiar with them, and also through other networks such as the Climate Migration Network that have been really supportive in connecting us to other groups and communities that might be interested in working with us. Excellent, thanks. Um, Megan, a follow-up on your survey is, uh, what are the next steps you're planning for the survey? Do you plan to administer it again to the, the same recipients in the future, or are you planning a different method to, to follow up? Um, I have, I'm sort of working on a big project that will incorporate um, more of these surveys, but also deeper cases um, and uh, kind of constructing more of policy histories, right, within particular settings, right, to understand the, the evolution of local government decision making and how 
right? Prior decisions by local governments are, are shaping these differential risk exposures. Um, and so there'll be some, some deep cases, but I also want to do more survey work, right? Because I think there is some value in, in getting the perceptions as they're developing, right? Among this population of, of such critical decision makers. Um, and so the, the next step in that space is actually um, kind of regionally focused surveys that um, will allow me to start uh, honing in on particular forms of climate impacts that are more dominant in some regions than others. That sounds fascinating. I think the history of the pathway sort of government decisions set people on sounds really interesting. And also sounds like that will pair well with the, what Linda and Jamie are finding in this, you know, things are so interconnected that it's hard to tease out just, just the risk reduction or just the flood risk reduction component of that. So that's, right. that's really critical. Yeah. yeah. Um, Alex, following up on your program, curious about the distinction between the buyouts and the acquisitions. Do you have information on how the decision was made, which property should be redeveloped and which property should not be redeveloped? Uh, I can briefly speak to that and say, yeah, uh, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> uh, and the, the policy and procedure manual that uh, sort of outlines some of this is available um, online but yeah the, the buyout program it was mostly buyouts that that seems to be the bulk of of these things um but before i you know put my foot in my mouth because it does get um pretty complex the, the policies and procedures are available on our website and uh, diving into that should give uh, a clear answer between those excellent thank i didn't mean to put you on the spot with a uh you know give the official <laughs> every single decision no problem <laughs> yeah um, and then this question I'm going to open up, uh, Alex and Kelly, you obviously through your organizations work directly with communities, but we have a question here about the role academics can or should play in coordinating with communities and supporting communities directly. So any academic want to, to discuss uh, your thoughts on academic community collaboration? I wouldn't at least mind mentioning, since you mentioned my name, uh, that we are happy to partner with academics and we have done so um, and are in the middle of doing so, uh, particularly with uh, some now at Cornell. Um, I think we've got some Harvard stuff coming in down the way. So if you're interested in some of the data that we found and matched, um, happy to partner on some of that stuff, but that's all I'll say there. Anyone else yeah. wanna jump on that one? Yeah, I might, if, if I may also just say that, you know, I. I myself and my team members as well come from backgrounds in research and we understand the value and the importance of this research and the way that we're approaching our services is directly responding to the amazing research that folks have been doing in this space for the last number of decades. That being said, I think that even in this presentation, what we're seeing is a lot of um, review of what has happened before which for me is very much in alignment with one of the major problems in bio programs, which is that they're reactionary and they're reactive and they're not proactive. And so part of the work that we're doing now, especially in these early phases, is in some ways about applied research, but it's actually hands-on. It's actually helping communities get resources or make those decisions at the same time that we're learning by doing. And if that's something that other researchers or academics and universities can support, as was mentioned, you know, Ciders in your presentation, building that capacity by doing that hands-on research and helping communities get resources and make decisions, I think could be a really powerful way to apply all the knowledge that's in this space. The one thing I would say, um, based on my experience in various forms of partnerships um, over time is, just how important these myriad forms of boundary organizations are um, because of the really um, sort of different orientations, different timelines, different expectations, different demands on time um, between sort of uh, professional academics and kind of community members who need immediate answers. There is such 
in my experience, there is such expertise um, in all of the organizations that, as Kelly just described, sort of can speak the language of university research and also are in everyday engagement with communities. Um, in, in my experience, all of you who occupy that space really enable these kinds of partnerships um, to, to be effective um, and, and work for communities. I'm reflecting still on Cider's uh, more provocative keynote this morning. And I think that there's um, opportunities for researchers to work closely with communities and to be engaged in ways so that the work that we do is actually relevant and practical and human, humanly sensitive to the, for, for researchers, it's just an intellectual question, but for the people on the ground, it's actually their home and their lives. At the same time, I think that when you are partnered with communities on the ground, the kinds of things that you can ask or do are going to be very different because it is materially part of their lives. The kinds of questions you can ask, the kinds of solutions you can dream or even begin to verbalize are much more, I think, um, constrained by the realities and the political dangers of what it means when you actually put those words out into discourse. Um, so I think that there's a fine line to be walking uh, between like, us sitting in a space and dreaming of science fiction realities where, you know, oh yes, wouldn't this bold thing be great? And people on the ground are thinking this would be horrific for us. Um, but I think that there's, it doesn't need to be all one or the other, but a space for both, even for an individual researcher to be in, in those uh, different spaces over the course of all the different work that they do. I think that's a great point. Uh, and it, you know, circles back to, well, to, to a theme, I guess, a number of presentations, right? That, yeah, we recognize these are interesting analytical problems, but they're also, they're also someone's life, right? So it's also not a theoretical problem, but a, a real practical thing that's happening. Uh, well, we are at time. So thank you so much to the presenters for your presentations today, for all the projects that you're working on. Thank you to the audience for your questions. Uh, some of them have been answered in writing in the chat, so please check there. And uh, I'll volunteer the speakers that most of us would probably be glad to speak further if we haven't adequately answered your question in the chat and so forth. So. Uh, please let us know. And thank you very much to Autumn and Jack who have been running things from behind the scenes and keeping me on track. I really appreciate that and, and the technical support as well. So enjoy your next session at this conference. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Great. Are we done being live? Thank you so much, Jack, for all your help. I really appreciate it. Yes, no problem. Of course. Have a good conference. You too. Take care. Great job. <laughs>